welcome back everybody and uh, glad to see you've all made it back from coffee and I'm really pleased to introduce this um, next session because um, we have Rune, Rune Christ Olsen here who I have, I have to say since last night I've heard more about Rune's workshop than I have heard about anything else on, on the um, whole course so I've heard wow and out there and vertical rooms and, and so um, Rune which is a nightmare for the facilitator, he's going to do a, an experiment uh, with us today. So uh, that's interesting, and I'm going to have to sum up at the end, so make it easy for me. And it's going to involve uh, moving beyond um, the frontier, which I think I'm in now, and it will also look at behind, behind the frontier, where I'm going in a minute, and, and Rune kindly tells me that I probably am already there, actually. So, uh, so I am delighted to introduce you, Rune, and really looking forward to seeing the, this session. Okay. Hello, yes, this is a great moment for me. I hope it also also be for you. Is I'm talking, I'm, I'm not talking in a some, per, right way or right uh, loud, loud, yeah. loud, 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 okay, that's it. Okay, I hope you have eaten your Marmite today. <laughs> hmm? Um, and if you haven't, you got a chance to taste on the Marmite now. <laughs> okay? Um, I made this uh, ses session, uh, this stage session here, uh, in a way to create a connection between the workshops and this lecture. And this lecture is going to be here. But the workshop is, have, in a way, continues here for a little while. Some, some minutes. Uh, and these beautiful people there helped me to build a wall, a human wall. Which in a way I can go through if I want to. Because now I am on the beyond side. And you have probably tried to, to, to get over to be the beyond uh, sometimes this week, hasn't it? Some of you has. And then probably some of you are there right now. I hope so. Yes. And uh, when I go come here, I select that. I'm of course now. I'm I'm on the, uh, the behind side. No, I'm behind. But I'm going to read these texts for you a little. Is it all right? Because I don't know if you and everyone sees that so good as I do up here. Um, uh, you, uh, perhaps you have heard about these two rooms in the workshops. The vertical room and the horizontal room. Hmm? And this, uh, posters has, this posters have been outside this room, just to illustrate uh, what it what, uh, signify. Uh, um, uh, yes, what type of room it is. And I read it. Vertical relationships. It's, I, I'm not talking so, you know, loud uh, voice uh, that you can hear. Okay, that's good. Vertical through leadership. With someone above as superiors to lead and others below as subordinates to be led. Hmm? By the virtue of what you are through your position and rank. Yeah, in your workplace today. Leadership is utilizing the human what? Yes, your position and your rank. You have written in some the visit cards, as you probably remember. So it stands just right there. And you have been to this uh, mechanical assembly line to practice this, uh, this uh, being here in this, this type of relationship, I know. And some liked it, or perhaps some didn't like it. But that's Marmite, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Isn't it? I had never tasted it myself. <laughs> But I think I will do next time I get to Wales, if I got a new opportunity, a new chance. Okay. This is, yeah, this thing here is, this behind thing here is leadership for someone and the few. You are the someone and the few because you are leaders and manager and, and you are here because just of that. Okay. And leading as leadership, this is leading from a position. You are leading from a position through a rank. Okay? Well, I say okay. <laughs> but uh, I don't know it's, if it's okay for you. But it's okay to, 
for me in this, uh, this, this place of relating vertically with you. I'm standing here and you're sitting there. Yeah. I'm looking down on you and you're looking up on me. It's not communication, it's just information, you know? Yeah. And you can report to me afterwards, but that's still not communication. This is leading of persons. You are leader of persons, managing persons. Huh? And this is what I call, this is the, a little tricky thing. This is here, this is the conditional equality and dignity for those who are in positions and ranks, for those superiors. It's not equal, equality and dignity for, for the persons who are subordinates on the floor. Therefore, this is unconditional equality and, and uh, dignity. Okay? Shall I uh, just stay here a little moment so we can watch this behind the sphere of your current reality? Workplace reality? Mm. Yes, it's, it's important to feel, feel a little about this because learning is about feeling, mostly. But <clears throat> because thinking process is, can be very learnful if you have the, the feelings with you uh, in this way. Okay? I move. This is my place, my room. I, I think I have been beyond the, the last 30 years. I didn't know until 10 years ago, but I think I've been there. And this, uh, I hope, I, someone others also have to, like, will like to come once or visit me here. Hmm? This is the horizontal relationships. Horizontal through leadership. That's a word I invented in 2006. With everyone as coordinates co to lead oneself together with others who are leading themselves. By the virtue of who you are through your own person. It's nothing about positions, it's nothing about ranks. It's about roles, of course, and functions. It's nothing about what you are. It's just about who you are. Okay? And leadership is utilizing the human who, the person inside of you. Um, leadership is, is leading of processes. You see? Leading of processes in, in, in all types of processes in the workplace, in the organization. And leadership here is for everyone and the many. Okay? Leadership is for everyone and the many. And leadership training, if this is a, had been a leadership training compound, then what? Everyone in the Wales Public Service uh, had been here. Probably too many, but then we had, to made, then we had made some smaller arrangement, which <clears throat> that had included everyone. So leadership is for everyone and the many, compared to leadership for someone and the few. Okay? And here leading is a function, leading as a function. In this sense, you never lead other persons. You just lead, this is leading as a function. When you go back home, when you go to your private sector of life, uh, I will assume that most of you practice leadership in your private life as equals and peers and with dignity and grace. I will assume that. Yeah? It's not an assembly line in your home, private life? Well, I don't think so. <clears throat> so we are in a way doing, practicing leadership privately. But when we go behind, we are probably practicing leadership professionally with positions and ranks. Okay? And this is a leading of processes, as I said. And here it's unconditional equality and dignity because everyone is included. Everyone is here. 
to participate. And no one is outside of this, this sphere here. Can you imagine a such of a setting? Even if you haven't eat marmite today. Okay. Any reactions? What, what, what did you say? I think there's a big assumption in the physical relationship. Yes. at the moment um, I'm uncomfortable that you're saying that our work the workforce doesn't yeah. have dignity or um, doesn't receive dignity um, and I wonder what your background is in terms of organizational structures and your experience of it because yes. it doesn't reflect mine yes yes well I'm going to tell a little story afterwards so uh, just to, to clear up that a little. But we have different experiences. We have di are different persons. And this is my reality. This is my experiences. And I got out of this, uh, this uh, vertical sphere for many, many years ago. But I'm looking into it. And I'm also visiting this sphere many times during my studies and my research. And I see what happens there. So, but it's up to you, in a way. It's not a facet, it's just up to you to find out where you are and how, where you want to go and where you want to stay. Moving beyond or staying behind, it's up to you. Well, I will come back to this in the lecture. But you, in a way, you have the picture now, huh? This is the connection to the workshops. Uh, is it so far so good? Huh? Human beings? Okay. Okay? Is it all right? Yeah. Thank you, my human wall. You have been terrific. Terrific. <laughs> yes. Thank you. You can. Uh... Here, not here, just uh, here, 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 yeah, like this, yeah, 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 I can't help you, like that, okay, and this in here, like that, and this here, <coughs> okay, okay, yes, okay, um, I will use this occasion to greet and thank deeply and warmly the wonderful persons that have assisted me on my journey to Wales and Lampeter. In general, I would thank you all attending in inviting me to this event. And in particular, particular I will thank Neil, Joe, Christine, and another Christine, Stephanie, yeah, Rebecca, Zoe, Laurie, Debbie, Brian, Andrew 1, Andrew 2. <laughs> and also Bryony, who's still in the office, I heard. Uh, she's helped me with this, uh, this transporting uh, things, which brought me here. Airplane and so on, yes. And I will also thank, of course, all the rest of the staff in PSMW. But I will also add, add to this, I will also thank Mary Huge, Huge, Huge and Howard Marshall who advised PSMW to, to let me have this chance or to take me in. Well, it was a little risky, wasn't it, Neil? <laughs> it became... <laughs> a, big risk. a big risk, yeah. I, under, I understand that during this week, yeah. <clears throat> yes. Your dedicated support have made a significant difference in making my contribution and my performance come true. 
I hope, therefore, that I will be delivering a performance that you can be proud of. You wonderful people. Yeah. I'm very thankful and honored of having had the pleasure of working with this excellent team of providers. Yes, thank you very, very much. I'm very grateful. I just blow my head in. <laughs> yes. Okay, before I start my presentation, I must say some words of notice. You will perhaps, during this uh, the, the displaying of the text, find some of the content. Is it echoing? No. Content somewhat strange, awkward, and at, perhaps at some time troublesome. I beg you instinctively not to take anything of what I say or do personal or as a critic of your own person. I'm not in any way intending to insult or offend you with my oral or written words. If you nevertheless should feel disappointed or hurt, I hope that you would forgive me for my unpretended and undesirable action. My inputs, I know, can be challenging and confronting when they deal with alternative ways to think and practice the work and art of leading. Nonetheless, the traditional role as a leader and manager will be scrutinized and dissected from my point of view. And I must be willing, of course, to take the risk in being criticized in bringing these perspectives into lightness. However, bear with me and be indulgent in the moments when you eventually would feel somewhat provoked. But change is about exceeding limits and restrictions established as, a, as warning signals and codes of tree passing accepted standards, norms and values. Okay, and here we go. Um, it's on, is that someone's whispering in, up there? No, it's uh, just uh, no. <clears throat> It's about me. <laughs> well, I'm used to that, so. Okay. Why is it so that leadership programs or events seldom or never seem to fulfill the expectation and demands of changing the way we work? How we organize work and people and how our thinking and practices seems deadlocked to fixed standards, traditions, conceptions and preconceptions. I have observed, studied and analyzed leadership development programs the last 20 years. And my main observation is that leadership is still very much and absolutely connected and fixed to the leader as a person and not to the function of leading as a process. In every type of leadership programs, as I see it, we are being served the same and ongoing demand for new ways of doing the job, new ways of organizing work and people, new ways of leading workplaces and workforces, new ways of making substantial change in the mind and heart of people in preparing the future. Hmm? The word new ways has always been uh, um, something that has penetrated the whole lead lead leadership traditions in developing leaders. The common notion of this inquiry is the joint demand of creating new ways of doing and practicing management, leadership and organizations. What is really attained and gained the last decades by proposing and emphasizing the need for new ways in doing the job? Are there any signs of significant and substantial change and transformation in the way we are thinking and practicing management and leadership today? compared to what we did five or ten years back. Why have our own intentions, aspirations and ambition in creating new ways of doing the job not really led to new ways in thinking and practicing management and leadership? Hmm? Okay, the main thing that strikes me personally, because of my experiences, which are different as yours, in yours of course, is that our conception of the nature in organizing work and people has not changed a bit over the years. The momentum of leadership is still based on our ingrained and inherited belief in leaders and followers, of someone about to lead and others below to be led, of superiors with power to make decisions and subordinates without the authority to make own and personal decisions. And subsequently, the absence of personal independence, 
to act responsible and in taking responsibility actively on their own. Yes, that's my, in a way, professional history. Short, not perhaps nice, but it's my history. The prime starting point with my earliest project was in the early 1980s. The prime starting point with my earliest project in the 1980s was that the superior person, as a direct director, etc., wanted strongly to make herself or himself redundant and superfluous as a superior leader in ch charge, with the intention of committing the others in the workplace in taking substantial and significant responsibility for their own and personal area of work. This was a starting point in the first project in, I think, in 1982. Autumn 1982. The process implemented aimed in creating an awareness and consciousness inside the individuals as independent and responsible persons in the working community. Mm. When people had attained and gained the belief in their own ability and capability in operating independently, taking responsibility and cooperating coordinated, they were at that moment of understanding and confidence, enabled with the personal conditions in working alone and together as autonomous and sovereign individual human beings. The people in the workplace got gradually, these workplaces got gradually used to this particular thought of working and doing the job. In this way, new way of organizing, managing and leading oneself and each other, when they got aware of and understood that this way in leading oneself together with others actually was a way for everyone in doing their jobs. And suddenly, after some time, they did it. <coughs> Practicing this. Independently and a bit high grade of responsibility. The main pre precondition for this amenity Pity process was that the person in charge as a leader of persons had let go of one, one own supreme power in favor of sharing the power with everyone in the workplace. Yes, it's to let go, to let something come in, isn't it, Neil? Yeah. This is what leadership is all about, to let go of the power, supreme position, get rid of these positions and ranks. However, this exercise and practice proved in this project proved insufficient and not ad adequate in establishing sustainable organizations and workplaces. These organizations in the 80s and 90s lacked the necess necessary and quite vital prerequisite of formalization and institutionalization. In sustaining the new way in doing the job and the new way in structuring power, the need of formalizing the new power structure and the new organizational structure was essential and vital for the survival of the new ways in making substantial change. Because of this experience, I started by the late 90s and later the develop development of the new workplace reality concept, which event eventually led me in creating the concept of leadership. And here am I. I'm very glad for it, so it's a pleasure to be here together with you, I hope. It's, it's for me and I hope for you. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, um, uh, as you, someone of you know, I have developed a book, a practical book, as I call the Leading Ship Field Book. And this field book is is developed, is at, uh, can used, be used by you in developing your own workplace and organization. And I will lead you through this book a little. Uh, I will go through thoroughly some pages of the book and I will jump over, I'll jump uh, through pages that is relevant, but I, we can, I have not that time to go through all the pages. It's 53 pages, uh, but some of them, okay? And I will also, you will get an exercise on the end. You've got some papers here, but I think it's enough to have one exercise that will uh, signify the relationship between 
the vertical and the horizontal leadership and leadership. Okay, the field book agenda. What this, what this practitioner manual is all about is to share my dream, purpose, vision and mission with you. Through conceptualization of terminology and methodology with you all. And I will have some, this is the, the disposition of this, uh, this lecture. Dream, purpose, vision and mission. Okay, do you know what this equilibrium state of mind is? Think about it. And one thing more, can you imagine when the equilibrium of mind is reached? Think about it. Can you take one minute just to think about it? And you don't have to understand it, this. Just make up your own assumption or your own thought about it. Just feel around it a little. You don't have to, and you, you shall not be sharing this with others, so it's not. And I will not ask you, any one of you, a bit what it is, but yes, one minute. Okay, was it tricky a little? Yeah. Okay, now this is my dream, <coughs> and I, have, I think I have a page here which I have to write, read actually. My dream, yeah. This dream emerged first as an intuitive notion, as a feeling when I was very young. When I grew up and started on my professional journey, this dream was gradually converted from a loose feeling to a dense property of thought. It took me another year to become conscious, aware of this thought possession. And then I started out the attempt and effort in transforming the passion, this passionate thought of a distant dream to a committed action of decisive will as a modus operandi, ready for launching. Yes, so here I am. So, so here I are, I are. So here I am, not I am I, I am, I am, yes, okay. Let me go to this. The equilibrium state of mind in this setting is achieved when, and I think this is for me very, very important. This is so important for me that I almost the hair is rising on my, my body and I don't want to cry, but uh, the hair, I, I feel just uh, exhilarated in one way. One point, all externalized and outer control, ruling and leading is transferred from outside the individual person to inside the human being, from the outside of us to the inside of us. You, you, you got that? This is fairly simple, hmm? I think. Well, it's not simple when you use feelings on that, because uh, it takes time. The individual person has adopted and adapted the sense of authority, power, and internalized this sense of mind step inside and within the emotional and mental body. Hmm? And third, the awareness of, this, of the individualized internal power has grown to become an integrated part of the identity and personality and has been established as an intrinsic force of personal authority. Intrinsic, Neil, isn't it? Inside you. You know what it is when you got it. You know what is the feeling of being in love is. Yes. Of course, you have experienced this. Most of you, I will think. <laughs> okay, then we get to the fantastic part of this. Hmm? Well, I, I shall not exaggerate, but um, I, I like this very much, as you 
probably will, will, should, should, will know. The narrative of this momentum of equilibrium. The individual human being is able to operate 100% independent and function 100% responsible in the workplace. As the individual is doing in his or her private life. So it's not really no different. But think about 80% of the workforce is subordinate. And they go to work each day as subordinates with not this possibility, with not this option, with not this authority. Think about it, 80%. You're privileged. Ladies and gentlemen, very privileged. But pr perhaps this privilege is not so very good. I don't know. Okay, the cooperative consequences, consequence of this momentous stage caused by the personal shift in the state of the human mind, and now comes the best, huh? is that external controlling and mechanism and systems in the organization can be removed and replaced by the internal force of power inside and within the individual person. Just as you are practicing your relationship at home in private life. I don't think any, any one of you have some control persons or control systems at home, no, not, not really. Well, some surveying cameras perhaps to, to keep persons outside, not inside. Well, that's another thing. Hmm? Okay, and then the lat latent, latent human potential can be fully released and applied in adding infinity values at work. And I mean really infinity. It's no limit when you, when you release these uh, potentials. These enormous resources inside persons. Do you think 80% of the, the workforce when they are released with all their potential? Do you think what, this will, what, what will happen? It will be just chaotic and anarchy and, well, you can't manage it as leaders and managers, of course not. But that's not the point. You see? You got this? Shall we go on? I don't know if this is got getting better and better or worse and worse, but... Um... <laughs> okay. I'm in my momentum, so you can't stop me. <laughs> okay, I will say one thing. Uh, I, have I have taken a liberty to, to conceptualize this, uh, this relation between behind and beyond. And when I saw this t overture about beyond frontiers, I had to make something out of it. And then I suddenly realized it's a relationship behind and beyond, and not just beyond frontiers. Because to get the sense of beyond frontiers, you have to get the sense of what's behind, you know? And get into also that. And that's the vertical uh, playroom, as someone you have been to, okay? So managing beyond the, and be, or behind frontiers, you are all invited to explore, discover and encounter the, and experience the dimension between behind and beyond and find out whether you want to stay behind or move behind, beyond. The moving beyond will provide you with insight to capture new and alternative ways in managing work and people, which I call risk a risk-based approach, which I'm always, um, in a way, <laughs> that's my risk I'm always doing. It's a, it's a large risk in doing this this week, of course. But uh, I wouldn't have gained anything if I hadn't been doing that. But this is the only way I can practice my, my own beliefs and my own values. So here I am. The staying behind will at the present, and I mean in this leadership momentum, momentum of leadership, the staying behind will at the present moment protect you from the challenges and changes that belong to the future, and instead confirm your well-known practices and beliefs. And I call that evident-based approach. Okay? Step, step. And behind, we find the old traditional conventional management theory and practice, evidencing the known and the safe. And beyond, the new alternative progressive management theory and practice, risking the unknown and the certain. So, get into my boat, 
and we together can uh, come over the, this, uh, this large ocean of uncertainty. But I know we can manage. I know we can lead each, each one ourselves and each other together. I know I have been there. Okay, this is our model. You see? Managing behind or beyond the frontier and model. There up you got conventional and tra traditional uh, approach. Present. The way we always have done the job, that's hard to get off. Mm? The old ways is evidence-based and still valid and sufficient. Of course, it is. It's, that, it's what we know. And predictable. We know what we have, but we don't know what we get. Now that's very important. The safeness. The safeness in staying behind. But that doesn't make new ways in managing and leading people. Absolutely not. And beyond progressive and alternative approach, future and unpredictable, the new way is risk-based, where exploring and exper experimenting with new potent resources is essential, and as such, might become vital and fatal. I think this beyond thing here the, is a way in practicing the future in some years' time. I think it will come. And then the historians can, uh, can read, make books about the, the past, about leadership. And we can study <laughs> the story. Unpredictable, okay. The old way is obsolete and not applicable in solving new challenges and will be replaced by a new set of mind. But it will not be replaced by a new set of leadership because that's outdated. Okay? Well, yes, here is a question. You can use that in, when you get back, okay? In your workplace, if you want to. Together with your colleagues, not alone and not here. The only place this is relevant is back home. And you get this on a stick, memory stick. Okay? Interesting question, huh? Where in are you going? My credo, you know what the credo is? The strongest belief of the strongest. My credo is still intact, in spite of, despite of what happens around me. Um, <laughs> and that's uh, per perhaps not a good thing, but um, it's me. Okay, everyone can lead when the adequate conditions, internal inside and external outside, are provided and supported. And the factors is personal freedom, and I mean freedom, real freedom. Mutual trust, I'm trusting in you. I hope you are trusting in me. Individual independence, people can work alone and just sit thinking in their office if they want to. And in the way I'm working without being disrupted or being looked down upon of others, which is, yeah. Personal responsibility and the methodology here is leadership for everyone. Here we are now. Hmm? You are following a little? Shall we go on? The creator of leadership is methodology for someone. There. Someone above to lead and others below to be led based on imposed dependency. As the author Jim Collins is stating, and the walls came tumbling down, and he said, allow those with true leadership to rise to position of responsibility. But this is a leadership guru. And he has sort of developing leadership as a new way of approaching the future. But what is the understatement and the underlying meaning here? Previous statement indicate that those few shall occupy positions of responsibility, while those many freely commit to follow in line. Thank you. The walls are therefore still intact, in spite of the wheel of delusion and of change. 
The many are still dependent on the few in attaining the privilege of taking responsibility independently and autonomously. We have seen many attempts the last decades of disassociating and distancing oneself from the leadership stigma, the fixed and rigid position and ranks, and the callous justice of control and command. Oh, dreadful things. Hmm? In shaping and making the message of leadership more edible and digestible. Okay? In the pol is the polishing attempts of the term occurring because that the authorian traits and features of leadership, for instance, subjugation and subordination, not nice words, but anyway, it's the features of leadership, are something that people in general and superiors in particular, superiors in people in particular, feel that they rather should not be associated and connected with. Okay. Is the tension rising? You feel the energy? The serious energy? What is independence? Yes. Independence, personal freedom. Is a relationship established between the equal human beings where the respected individuals are enabled with the power and force of personal authority. The individuals are able to provide complementary expertise and supplementary capacity whenever people choose to cooperate in sustaining the interpersonal confidentiality of working alone and together. They don't work. They don't need to work in groups if they don't want. Because if they can do the job better themselves alone, of course, they do. But they need help from others to get out of their boxes all the time, each day. Independency, that's social integration based on the value of the free will and the belief in the free choice. In contrast to interpersonal segregation and separation based on the fear of social conflict and repression. Dependency, collaborative coordination when people are acknowledging that they are mutual, natural dependent of each other in releasing collective options and fulfilling common purposes for their own benefit at an advantage. So, deprivation of personal authority, cause and effect. Well, I'm running fast here, okay? Deprivation of personal responsibility and individual independence is in the relationships between those who rule and those who are ruled is leading to unnatural dependency and personal irresponsibility. And that's awful, isn't it? Do you think there are people uh, uh, in this 80% of subordinates who are respons uh, irresponsible? Because of their persons or their, uh, as human beings. Do you think so? Do you really think so? They are irresponsible because they don't take responsibility or they don't want to get, take responsibility. Do you think so? Do you really think so? There are persons in the workforce when they, as, of course, take responsibility when they come on. Do you think so? The repeatedly pattern of deprivation is avoidance and evasion of further, of more, or of non-responsibility, of course, of course. That's not true. I function as that myself. Because of the distrust and mistrust embedded in the nature of deprivative actions. Okay, here is something you can use later. Leadership is therefore inversely proportional to exercise of power by the few. You got it? A little. Leadership, leadership, and leadership is, the, on the other hand, inversely proportional to the exercise of the power by the many. So here we got the conflict. Here we got contrasts. Self-leadership. Self-leadership, Neil. Self-management, Neil. What do you think I will say about that? Huh? It is connected to the person in charge. While leadership is connected to the function of leading processes. So there you got it. At last, after many years. Yeah? In other words... <laughs> sorry, I'm just joking, you know. <laughs> Not bad feelings? No, I don't think so. In other words, self-leadership or self-management is for those few in position to exercise power, 
compared to those many others, dependent on their superiors in becoming empowered. You know, empowerment comes from persons above. Empowerment is, what, is the, one of the ways the vertical relationship is functioning. It's coming down the line. But I, I'm sure you will ignore that anyway. Of the time? <laughs> I don't also, know. Someone's just given me a note to say. Of the time? Minute warning. Ten um, minutes? Ten past. Huh? I think it's ten past. Okay. It? Then I work to. Can stay here to half past? No. Yeah, yes, we're going to do a bit of discussion. We're okay. Going to do a bit of discussion okay. on your. Yes, here you got the, some uh, things. Uh, I have to show you this. Consistent and inconsistent between thinking and acting, saying and doing. I got a model in the other in one of the rooms. You, you you remember? When we are thinking together, we can be moving in a transitional landscape of mind between beyond, behind, and beyond. When we are acting together, we are usually in the habit of returning to our fami familiar landscape, comfort zone, where conditions are set, fixed, and well organized within and behind. Why? For example, when we are, uh, we are thinking behind, thinking together, we can easily agree about the need of equality, mutuality, and dignity when we are thinking together. No problem. However, when we are um, back in the job setting and start acting together, we are at the same time back in the powering, empowering our existing relationships through position and ranks, superiority and inferiority. Someone about to lead and others blow to them. So, what's happening? Yes. It's very nice to be here and be and agree. It's nice to have persons who are understanding me. But when, when, but when you are back, when you are back at that job, I assume some of you, perhaps not all of you, well, will do something others, uh, uh, something else than they ha than you have thought of here. Consistence. Okay, one page of authentic test. You could do what you have done, meant to do, what your feelings have told you to do, in a state where your mental power might be overrun by your emotional power in generating actions. When your expressed thoughts would have been opposite and inconsistent with your ensuing actions. Therefore, your actions can be consistent with your feelings, meanings, in the actual matter, while the same actions can be inconsistent with your expressed thoughts. You just did not do what you said you would do because you did not mean to do it. Huh? Your conscience being manifested as your human self and embedded deeply in your feelings and emotions is your intrinsic compass. That tells you what to do if you listen carefully, closely, attentive and vigilant to the spirited signals Penetrating your mind as intuition. Acting according to your conscience is an act of pure, authentic presence of independence and responsibility. Acting against or across your conscience is an act of false pretension with the risk of compromising your true human self in serving opportunistic intentions, ambitions and agendas. How can you best serve your own integrity, reliability, credibility and accountability? To get your thoughts congruent and aligned with your actions, you must unite your mental state of mind and your emotional state of soul. A unity of mind and soul is, however, dependent on your awareness and on consciousness of your human self and your ability to connect with your inner flow of conscientious energy. In that way, you should be able to synchronize your thoughts and actions and get what you say and do anonymous and equivalent, reliable, credible and accountable. Okay? Yeah, just read when you come back tomorrow or something. Okay, here is questions. Adaptability. This is my pedagogical thinking, so you can you have it here. 
but uh, we, we, we have no time to, to, to explore this. So competence is the result of adoption. So, yes, competence is applied to learning. Okay, competence. Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, I got one page. I have to show you. you you've had lots of pages. No, no, no. But one, the last, the last one. You don't, you don't take that uh, option away from me. You can't. <laughs> That would be cruel, Neil. <laughs> okay. You've got one minute to show us your last Yeah, the, it, it is here. <laughs> yeah. Don't harass me, man. <laughs> okay, now we come to the really uh, bit stretching into the, th the future. For 2013, the summer school next year. Hmm? The potential change perspective for the future organization. From leadership, training and development for someone based on their position and ranks, staying within and behind. Okay? To leadership, training and development for everyone based on their person and competence, moving outside and beyond. What should this management project here do in the future? And what should you do when you come home? Are the persons next year here because of their persons and not positions? I don't know. But thank you very much for your attention. I love you all.